Hey everyone, my name is Samara. I'm currently an ASU Art Museum Museum Ambassador. And today for Storytime Saturday, we're going to be reading Stitchin in Poland. Uh, this book is by Patricia C. McKissack and it's illustrated by Cosby A. Cabrera. So yeah, let's just get started. So the introduction to the book. Jeez Bent in Wilcox County, Alabama is a rural community tucked away in an isolated curve of the Alabama River. What was once a land of plantations run by white slave owners evolved after the Civil War into a society of emancipated slaves. These residents were tenant farmers who over time became landowners. Set apart from the modern world, Jeez Bend has remained relatively unchanged over the years. Family, church, and traditions like quilting connect generations and continue to be the strengths of the community in the 21st century. Originally, quilting was the evening activity or chore for the women, which in addition to creating covers for warmth, also gave them a platform for storytelling, communicating, and singing the songs their mother sang. Quilting reinforced the ties between generations, from mother to daughter and beyond. Children sat beneath the quilt helping their mothers. They learned basic skills by taking the thread out of old quilts so they could be recycled for new quilts. As girls got older, they were invited to join their elders at the quilting table, where they pieced simple quilts. Early quilts were made from materials at hand, old jeans, work clothes, and dress tails. The back of a dress which sees the least wear and tear. Today, the quilt makers still search through used clothing, knowing that the memory of the person who wore the shirt, pants, dress, or skirt brings special meaning to the quilt. As one of the artists, and these quilt makers are certainly artists, Mary Lee Bendolf says, those clothes have the love and spirit of the people who wore them, and that's what I want my clothes to have, love and spirit. My family has spent the 1980s and 1990s researching and documenting the art of Southern African American artists. In 1998, while doing research, we saw a breathtaking quilt in a book. A search for the quilt brought us to G's Bend and the surrounding towns of Rockbooth and Alberta. Our first trip to G's Bend revealed a world of African American art that very few people outside the region had seen. Later, trips introduced us to more and more quilt makers. We soon realized that our role was to our role was to bring light not only to the quilts but to the quilt makers as well. In doing so, we were able to share their extraordinary history and art. The museums and gallery exhibitions, excuse me, through museum and gallery exhibitions, documentaries, and recordings of the sacred music of Jeez Ben, sung in the community and around the quilting frame, we've helped the world come to know these artists, their culture, and the town of Jeez Ben. I have seen the delight in my own children's eyes during their visits to Jeez Ben. The women, their stories, and their quilts have become a part of our personal history. As Louisiana Bendolf has said many times, we tell our stories not because we want people to feel sorry for us, for what we have been through, because we don't feel sorry for ourselves. We tell our stories because we are proud of who we are and where we come from. The story woven here by Patricia McKissack's words and Cosby Cabarera's illustrations interwines images of actual quilts, the history of the rural South, and the flight for the in the fight for the rights of African Americans throughout the country, which together celebrate a significant part of our collective heritage. And the introduction was by Matt Arnett from December 2007. G's Bend Woman, Women. G's Bend Women are mothers and grandmothers, wives, sisters and daughters, widows. G's Bend Women are cooks and homemakers, gardeners, church members, choir members, leaders. G-Spend women are talented and creative, capable makers of artful quilts, unmatched. G-Spend women are relatives, neighbors, friends, same as me. Who would have thought? For as long as anybody can remember, the women of G's Ben have stitched up quilts to be slept on and under, sat on at a picnic, wrapped in when sick, or covered with while reading on a cold winter night. Who would have thought that one day those same quilts would have been hanging on museum walls, their makers famous? Who would ever would have thought? Beneath the quilting frame. Baby girl, that's me. Played beneath the quilting frame on a nine patch quilt. My great great grandmother and her sisters made when great grand was herself baby girl. I remember 
the warm brown faces of my mama, grandma, and great grand as they sewed, talked, and sang, and laughed. Above my tented playground, all while steady fingers pieced together colorful scraps of familiar cloth into something more lovely than anything they had been before. Oh, how rem I remember. I remember mama's gentle voice singing softly, lulling her baby girl to sleep. Something else. My space beneath the quilting frame became too small for growing legs and questioning mind. Busy threading needles and cutting scraps, I listened and learned the recipes for 11 kinds of jelly, what to do for teething toddlers, how to get rid of mold, and the words to a hundred hymns and gospel songs, all the while waiting for my turn. Where to start? Today, Grandma winked at me. There is a promise in her smile. It is your time, she says, to piece your own quilt. How did, I, how did you begin your first quilt? I asked Mama. She is getting ready for work and the long drive over to Camden. Look for the heart. She pulls me close. When you find the heart, your work will, keep, your work will lead to life. Strong, beautiful, and independent. Remembering. Mama told me cloth has a memory. I hope the black corduroy remembers that it was once the pants my uncle wore to go vote for the first time, all clean and new. I hope the pink and green flower tablecloth remembers the peach cobbler I spilled on it at the 4th of July picnic before my brother went off to school in Boston, but we were still all together. I hope the white lace handkerchief remembers how pretty my cousin looked the day she got married to Junior all over again. I hope the dark blue work shirt remembers how hard daddy has worked all his life. If by chance the cloth forgets, I want to always remember all of it. Nothing wasted. Grandma wants me to learn to quilt using the old ways, all by hand, nothing wasted. Her nut brown hands gently unraveled the stitches from the hem of an old red and white gingham dress, stitch by stitch. Slowly, she backs out of the dress, taking apart what she put together long ago. Snip, snip, pull. The thread is gone. The dress falls apart. A puddle of red and white gingham on the floor. Now I know, a patch of grandma's old dress will be the heart of my quilt. Puzzling the pieces. A quilt is a puzzle made of cloth. Squares of red and white in hem, solid rectangles, print ones too, dotted triangles and a few plaids mixed in, flowered circles and long narrow strips spread out on the floor. Now comes the puzzling, mixing and matching colors, shapes, and patterns, finding combinations of pieces that fit like a puzzle, making a picture, telling a story. The River Island. Grandma says her quilts tell a story, so mine will tell one too. My story. Long strips of brown cotton border three sides of my quilt, just as, it, just as G's Bend is surrounded on the three sides by brown muddy waters, creating a river island, perfect for snakes and alligators. A strip of green is the fourth border, a symbol of the fields where my ancestors worked cotton from can to can't. Can't see in the morning until can't see at night. Years of toil on the G's Bend plantation owned by the G family who lived in a huge house called Sandy Hill. Above the green strip, I placed six squares that form the small communities of brown, square, brown quarters, white quarters, Rehoboth, Sodom, Over the Creek, and Lebanon, where families with the same name are not kin by blood, but by plantation.
being discovered. A large smoky gray square stands for hard times because I've heard great grandpa say during the depression of the 1930s, bad luck and trouble hovered over us shirt croppers like big old smothering gray hand. Then great grand adds, our houses were one or two room shacks with dirt floors and plastered in newspaper to keep out the winter wind. Most of us didn't even have indoor plumbing, but it was home. The land was poor. My great grandparents were poorer still, but we didn't know what my mama puts in. We managed to be happy somehow. Then G's Bend was discovered by sociologists, historians, educators, and journalists who came from everywhere. Some to help, some to share, some to study, some just to see. Photographers took hundreds of pictures. I've seen one of great Graham with grandma who was just a baby. G's Bend got the hiccups from all the excitement of the cameras clicking, brighter scribbling on pads, people talking breathlessly, never waiting for answers. Then it was over. Jeez Ben took a deep breath and went back to the way it had been before being discovered. Progress. Once the river ran free, then they built the dam and said it was progress. Acres and acres of rich farmland now was the bottom are flooded now. Land where black men and women named Petway and Bennett grew cotton before the Civil War for no pay. Where sharecroppers named Mingo and Williams worked the soil for very little pay. And where black farmers named Bendel, Young and Irby scratched out a living for slow pay. Now cotton mouths, alligators and catfish live in the bottom. Call that progress? Colors. Grandma says, blue cools. Red is loud and hard to control, like fire in a gossiping tongue. Green oozes, orange laughs, pink smiles, yellow warms, black protects. White shifts its shade from soft and bright to dingy. Purple is quiet. Lavender is sweet smelling like a newborn baby. Brown is hard working. Grandma says, colors show you how you feel deep down inside. I feel yellow right now, with a hint of orange. Stereotypes. Haven't been able to work on my quilt for two weeks. My cousin Ashlyn's been visiting from New York City. She left this morning. Yes, I will miss her, maybe. Ashlyn thinks she's as cool as blue. She reminds me of a duck, calm on the surface, but paddling like crazy underneath to stay afloat. The idea of making a quilt was way too country for Ashlyn. I'd rather paint or write a poem, she said. Quilting is painting, a poem with fabric. I told her, never mind. We still did what she wanted to do. TV, cell phones, CD players, video games, and a laptop computer with internet hookup. She was so surprised we have these things. I was surprised she thought we didn't. Pinky. Back in the 1960s, Mr. Willie Quill broke, her, broke horses for the Alabama State Mounted Patrol. Fine horses, well-trained. Mr. Willie Quill knew his horses. He knew Jimmy Lee Jackson too, a young man from Marion who was shot because he wanted to vote. We decided to protest the senseless killing by marching from Selma to the capital in Montgomery, remembers Mr. Willie Quill. The 54 mile march began in Selma at the Edmund Pettus Bridge. 600 of us stood on the bridge, ready to march. But the governor said, no, we couldn't. We walked anyway, midway the bridge, the mounted troopers attacked. I remember seeing those horses heading straight into us. We held hands and prayed. Beating hooves pound against the black top and the nice sticks hum as the troopers swing them like lassos. Mr. Really Quill braces for death, but not today, not bloody Sunday. Mercifully, he sees one of his horses. 
I throw up my arm and hollered, Pinky. The horse broke stride and veered away, allowing Mr. Willie Quilt to live, to tell the story. Mr. Willie Quilt broke horses for the Alabama State Mounted Patrol. Fine horses, well trained. Ask anybody. Mr. Willie Quill knew his horses. Thank goodness Pinky knew him. Dr. Cre Dr. King brings hope. I stitched the patch of bright pink to remember Pinky's story. Next to it, I sew a spotless white patch for the hope Dr. Martin Luther King brought to the bend. I've only read about Dr. King. Grandma saw him, heard him, marched with him. On a stormy February night in 1965, Dr. King spoke at Pleasant Grove Baptist Church. Grandma with mama in her arms was among the first to arrive. Every pew was soon filled, people stood. Some even stood outside in the rain. With misty eyes, Grandma says, the words we heard that night changed our lives. Peace, hope, justice, equality, truth, love, freedom. I would have followed him anywhere. And she did. The right to vote. Folks from G's Bend crossed the river to Camden, Camden, Alabama to register to vote. The next week or so, they shut down the ferry. Though the ferry is open today, it wasn't then. The official reason was no money to keep it running. Grandma recalls that time. Sure as I tell you, it was done to keep us from voting. Steady of a 20 minute ferry ride, the only way to get from G's Bend to Camden was to make the 50 mile trip by car or walk. I would have crawled to vote. Grandma's voice is strong. I believe her. What changed? In 1971, the all-black school was closed in G's Bend. Black students were bused to an all-white school 50 miles away. Then white students went to private schools. Today, the once all-white school is now mostly black. So what changed? Grandma votes no matter what. I go to school no matter where. Determination is rooted in our family tree and that hasn't changed. By and by. How many times have I heard the women sing and cry and cuff for each other while quilting and remembering? So I sing too. I stitch a patch of golden thank yous for James Reed, a young Boston preacher who was killed for believing in justice. In the background, I hear grandma's voice softly singing when the morning comes. A, bl a bright blue piece of velvet for Viola Luizo, a Detroit housewife who also came to G's Bend to help with the big march. Brave Viola, wife, mother, friend, an American hero assassinated because she believed in justice and freedom. Will we really understand it better by and by? I will mourn in a big plate people circle of white. I will mourn in a big plot. I will mourn in a big plot people circle of white, black, brown, and yellow and red for Reverend Dr. King, who was shot on that on that awful April day in Memphis in 1968. They say, will we ever understand it by and by? Grandma always says that darkness must have its hour, but morning always comes. Until then, we must tell the story of how we've overcome so we'll understand it better. Bye and bye. The Sewing Bee. Cheeseman quilters were discovered again in the 1960s and the Freedom Quilting Bee was formed to make and sell quilts. Orders came all the way from New York City. Were you a part of the bee, great grand? She closes her eyes and thinks before speaking. Each quilt meant a job, some money, a possible way out of poverty. My children profited from it, but with the orders also came strict rules. 
not a stitch could be out of place. Only traditional designs could be used. Nine patch, wedding ring, bear claw. Any variations were rejected. Yes, more money, less freedom. I chose to stay free. My way with corduroy. Come the 1970s, the Freedom Quilting Bee began to fill orders for Sears Roebuck. Loads of corduroy were sent to G's Band from Alabama textile mills. Big bolts of it for quilting pillows. Bright pillows of red, yellow, blue, and green corduroy. There is music in Great Grand's voice when she recalls. Good times came stitching corduroy. Great fabric for quilting, my designs, my way. Love that corduroy. Corduroy. An understanding will come later. My quilt, my quilt top is pieced. I spread it on the bed. Great grand nods her approval. Mama smiles. Grandma leads me to the frame on the porch. Knowing my hands put my quilt in place. How long will it take, I ask. Great grand shushes, shushes me. Come, join us. She holds out her hand. Mama hums, by and by. Five women surround me at the quilting frame all stitching and pulling, singing the old spirituals, same as always, except today I am a part of the group. Coffee colored, berry stained, nimble fingers with clumsy thumbs stitching and pulling together. In a slow and steady rhythm, patient, patient hands that guide without force, teach without punishment, an old, old process, women stitching and pulling together. When will we finish, I ask. Grandma's eyes and the tilt of her head say, be patient. Quilting takes time, days, even weeks. Relax and enjoy. I stitch and pull and listen in the warm yellow glow of an afternoon sun on the blue quiet of grandma's porch. The other women smile because they know. Finished. In several days, I've been asked for several days. I've been asking, "Are we finished yet?" Grandma laughs, and her cheeks rise in gentle mounds. With this one last stitch, I bit the thread and knotted. Finished. I have made my first quilt, stitching and pulling with others, but I am not complete. There are hundreds of ideas in my head. Quotes that are about me, the places where I live, and the people who have been here for generations. Why are you crying, Grandma? I ask. An understanding will come, she says. By and by, I added. And here's the picture of the quilt. Thank you guys so much for tuning into Storytime Saturday and listening to this wonderful story that talks about culture and art. Uh, yeah, it was a really good story. I really enjoyed it. And I hope that you guys did as well. And thanks again for joining us. Have a great rest of your Saturday.